giving announcements. And if something uh, triggers your interest, uh, we'd love for you to be participating. I also do want to express a word of appreciation for Leanne filling in on the piano today, so let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> the thought came to mind, and I thought I'd better do it now before I forget. Um, my mind went blank. There's been a mailing uh, that has been sent out uh, by Julie Scott, and I think some other people helped her, maybe Gayla. And that the mailing, uh, first of all, has, uh, the, uh, not, uh, has the giving statements, and that there's giving statements uh, in a little box uh, on a table. And if you would, please pick it up, so then they, it will not have to be mailed out. Also in there is that it's an opportunity for you to uh, select uh, five possible ministry options for here at First Christian Church. Uh, that we've been talking about this, and so now we're going to narrow it down to five possibilities. And so uh, be sure to pick that up. And then also, this is really exciting, is that we're going to be having our 140th anniversary celebrations of the church. And that will be on October 20th and 22nd. And I believe that announcement's in the, uh, uh, in the mailing as well. Is the school supply drive still going on? Okay, so if you didn't hear Leanne, is that if you still have school supplies that you want to donate, be sure to take it to parks and recreation. And then also, um, August 26 is the Tibble Days uh, breakfast. I know that uh, Le Leanne, you know, who's the organizer, always appreciates volunteers. And if you're not able to volunteer, if you can just be able to come and enjoy the delicious breakfast and uh, to give a donation. Uh, that I know that that would be greatly appreciated. Also want to encourage you to continue thinking about, and maybe you've already started composing your, your, your faith story, how you experience God. It does not have to be something spectacular. It can be something mundane as to how God is experiencing, how you're experiencing God right now. Or perhaps maybe you aren't experiencing God right now. And that's all right to tell a story about that. And so I want to encourage you uh, to share your faith story and that uh, to write it out uh, or, or to type it out. And if you type it out, to make sure it's no more than one page and uh, two pages handwritten. I think I covered everything for announcements. Are there any announcements? Okay, so the, the parting song is the hymn. Okay. Any announcements? There are no other announcements in the list. Now I have. Oh, okay, so the parting song is the hymn. Yeah. Yeah. So let us now have the prelude.
Thank you, Leanne. Uh, Wednesday night at the Health and Well-Being, Sharon gave a devotion on Jesus Loves Me that uh, really is amazing. So you ought to see her so she can tell you that story. The Apostle Paul knew most deeply what we have mostly never known at all. The church is the bond of peace and the unity of fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It's not an organization set up to provide religious services, spiritual help, and family chaplains. It's not a building to come to and to experience good worship and a relevant message. No, the church is not the people. Christians gathered in a building in Jesus' name are merely a Christian crowd. The church actually rises and falls based on the bonds between us. The church is the bond the deep bonded attachments between the blood, the blood-bought sons and daughters of God, bound together by the Holy Spirit in the very body of Jesus Christ. In him, we are seated in the house of heaven and stretching out across the whole earth. It's why our relationships are the mission. It's why awakening rides on the rails of friendship bound in the knots of our banded fellowship it's time we started working on the bonds. This paragraph is from a recent seedbed devotional uh, that I walked together with uh, through Paul's letter to the Romans. I continue to hear the word relationships from the Holy Spirit, and I have repeatedly come upon this neon green plumber's van that says it's all about relationships. I believe this is the answer to my request to God about what it is that he wants me to do. So much so that I just ordered a shirt, and I wish it had come in because it was purple with sunflower on it, and it says, Jesus, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. I think God wants me to build relationships with others, and in those relationships share his love for all things, including you. And you know, sometimes it's a real struggle to love people, but in order to win people over to Christ, we must start building these relationships with each other and build some understanding to our disagreements. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. In this verse, in John 17, 20 and 21, Jesus prayed for two things. He prayed, one, for us to be in a relationship with each other in the same way as he and the Father are in a relationship uh, with, the, with each other and in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And two, for our relationships to be anchored in and animated by the relationship between the Father and the Son in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. He couldn't be any more clear. The faith of the unbelieving world depends on our relationships of the people within the believing church. Our call to worship this morning is from 1 John, not 1 John, from John 13, 34 and 35, in the words of Jesus. I give you a new commandment that you love one another, just as I have loved you, and also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to worship you today because we love you, and we want to love you more. And we come to worship needing love in our lives, love for family, for friends, strangers, and enemies. In this hour of worship, please touch our hearts, fill our hearts, and open our hearts to your love, which passes all understanding. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now we'll sing, There's Within My Heart a Melody. There's within my heart a melody Jesus whispers sweet and low Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still In all of life 
life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. Discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken streets, stirred the slumbering courts again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Worship his holy name. 
may be seated. So we've come to a time of concerns and joys. I do have a particular joy that's sitting out in the audience today. And it's my niece, Abby, and my great niece. She'll always be my great niece, Quincy. And then also um, uh, Tyler, um, my other nephew, or I guess nephew-in-law, however you want to say it. And, and then you have um, Leroy. Jeez. And so uh, Leroy, shall we say, has plenty of energy. And so they're at a park right now. So I do want to mention these concerns and joys is that first of all, Beth Combs has severe infection in the bone chips in her open wound on her lower leg. Her dad, Jim Combs, has mostly retired from his architecture firm and needs prayers to stay healthy and busy in church work. So we've been praying for Beth Combs and very sorry for what's going on. It's, it's just been a very difficult time for her. So I'll be praying for both Jim and, of course, most of all for Beth, uh, that God's healing will be upon her. Marla Gravat, did I say that right? Uh, wants prayers for her blood work, that her blood work is clear of any disease. So that's a prayer of joy. And then uh, also continue praying for Christopher. And then uh, lastly, uh, it's a prayer of uh, mixed feelings. And I know that she doesn't want attention, but I'm going to bring attention to her because she's been such a faithful member of this church. Uh, Mary Margaret's going to be moving on August 19th, I believe. And that, um, so she'll be moving down to somewhere in Johnson County, Overland Park. What's that? Atriums. Atriums. So uh, we uh, just want to say that we have been very blessed by you being a part of this uh, ministry, and so uh, we hope that your move will be go smoothly and that you just thoroughly enjoy your new place. So let us now have a few moments of silent prayer. life-giving and comforting God. Well, first of all, I want to lift up those who are listed on the back of the bulletin as the, they're part of what we've been praying for at Health and Well-Being Service. The list is too long just to go through all the details of what every person's going through, but you know what's going on in their lives, dear God. And I pray, dear God, that indeed they will feel your presence and not feel alone. I pray, dear God, that they will get the best of care that they richly deserve, as any person deserves when they're going through some sort of life difficulty. Dear God, one of the things that I really do appreciate with this congregation is that they have the health and well-being service. 
Sometimes we say we're going to pray for you when somebody tells about a particular difficulty or joy, but we never really follow through. But that the health and well-being service is one where we do follow through. And I give thanks and praise, dear God, that to whoever initiated it and who has kept it going over the years. And so I give thanks and praise, dear God, for the health and well-being services. For it is indeed, dear God, a powerful way to reach into people's lives that sometimes they're forgotten as they're going through particular struggles in their lives. And dear God, as we are starting to think about what direction to go as a church, we need to be paying attention to you as to what kind of church you want us to become. That we know that you want us to be reaching deep into the lives of people, to let them know that we care and that we're there for them, to help them through whatever sort of struggles they have or just to uh, rejoice with them for whatever blessings they experience. So I pray, dear God, as we go about making the selection of the five possible options and then deciding what to do with those five possible options, that we'll be paying attention to you, hearing what you're telling us. For we know, dear God, that this is not about what we want, but about what you want. And we know, as I'll be talking about in a few moments, is that, you're, that you've got the most powerful thing here on earth, and that is your redeeming love through the crucified and living Jesus Christ. And so, dear God, help us move forward with confidence, knowing that you're a God that has a purpose, knowing that you're a God that has, uh, provides abundance to all congregations, if we pay attention. So I pray we will indeed pay attention to the direction that you want us to go. Help us, dear God, remember the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Matthew 5, verses 38 to 48, an eye for an eye. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Love for enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your enemy, but I tell you, and hate your, I'm sorry, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good 
and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. God bless the reading of today's lesson. Thank you, Gayla. I imagine if I ask you right now, and I, I'm not asking you to do this, but if I d decide to ask you to raise your hand, if you have any enemies, most of you would not raise your hand. And maybe none of you would. And that many of you may say that you've never had any enemies in your lifetime. Now, certainly there's been people that have gotten on your nerves or that you've been angry at or have deeply hurt your feelings, but that you never really saw them as your enemy. Our understanding of an enemy is someone that we have a constant con conflict, that we want their lives to get worse, and we want them to fail and be humiliated. Now, you may not hold that kind of emotion towards anyone, but that we may see groups as our enemies. Right now, the Russians and Chinese are popular villains in culture and politics. Or we may want to downgrade the blacks, the Hispanics, and or Asians. We may not care for the poor, or the transgender, or the gays. Or we may say that the rich are viewed as greedy, corrupt, and exploitive of people. Or maybe our enemies are political, that you have the know-it-all snobby elite liberals or those uh, knuckle-dragging conservatives. I have to confess that my enemies right now are the Russians and Chinese government, not the people, but the governments. I feel that they are a threat to the United States and the world. And I hate how they treat their citizens and people outside of their countries. And though I may be right in my analysis about the Russian and Chinese government, is that if Jesus was sitting in the audience at this very moment, I believe he would stand up and say, Bill, stop it. I'm mad at it. Love your enemies. He may turn around and say the same thing to the rest of you. Hating is evil. I've got to say this again. Hating is evil. It makes us miserable and creates all kinds of dysfunction and problems that we don't need. Last week, we heard part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It was the first major public sermon that Jesus had done. It's in the book of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7. And that last week we learned about the Beatitudes, about how we are to be the salt and light of the world. Today we're going to tackle another famous passage of Jesus during his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus flips upside down people's understanding of how we relate to our enemies. He tells that if a person slaps you on one cheek, then turn and let them slap you on the other. If somebody wants your shirt, let them take your coat. And if they force you to walk a mile, then go ahead and walk two miles. This is nonviolent resistance. This is an, uh, an act of defiance. And I promise you that those who were there that day hearing Jesus' sermon, that they were astounded by what he was saying. They lived in a world in which that you were to seek revenge when wrong. Jesus is saying resist, but in a nonviolent way. Recall, I recall one time and this is kind of a silly story, but in my, in my mind, this was, it makes me think about today's Bible lesson, that I was in a fraternity, and this was in the early days after I just joined a fraternity, we had a fraternity house, 
and there's this guy that was taller than me, and for, in my mind at that moment, I felt was scarier than me. And he said some crude things to me, some rude things to me. He was trying to intimidate me. And I swear, it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me, in which I said, oh, Jack, that is so sweet and kind of you to say that. In hindsight, it was like, had I thought that through, I would never have said that. But what happened is that he just stood there. It was thundering silence, and he walked away. He didn't know how to respond. If I responded eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth by saying something uh, rude and crude back to him, you know, he would have known how to handle that, but he didn't know how to handle the way I responded. And again, I give credit to God for that moment. Jesus wasn't done in what we heard in today's Bible lesson, in which he says, but I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Jesus points out that what good is it to love those who love you? That even the pagans and tax collectors love those who love them. That Jesus is being abundantly clear that we are to stand out from the rest of the world. The rest of the world should see us as people being different from the rest of culture. This is a particularly important in a world where vengeance and payback it's encouraged. Since Barb and I's arrival in the Leavenworth, we've received some teasing about living in a famous, in a town where you have the famous federal prison. And in fact, they even had one friend who said that, uh, be careful. Apparently, he, was a, he thought that people were escaping all the time and that we'd uh, be attacked. But for many people, prisoners are enemies, and that we cannot trust any of them, and that they're going to be a threat to society at all times. Now, I have volunteered and then was employed at the federal prison while I was in seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Also, I have volunteered at a juvenile detention center. Working in the federal prison was a great experience. And most of the men, not all, most of the men were sorry for what they did. They were really wanting to get back out and start over again. Nevertheless, there were definitely men that you knew that the second they got out, they would get in trouble again and not be at a minimum security prison, but that be at a higher level uh, security prison instead. I'm going to give a couple examples. Excuse me. So, for there to be a success in integrating former prisoners back into society requires for us to take the, uh, today's teaching seriously, to not see them as enemies, but as someone to love. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Ten days ago, I was in uh, waiting to get my hair cut. And a woman sat beside me. And we started visiting. And that it turns out that her husband at one time had served as a chaplain at the Kansas Penitentiary in Lansing. And that she shared as to how uh, the, you know, the, that the, for the prisoners to be involved in this particular ministry, which was prison fellowship, that they had to go through a strenuous screening process. And not all of the prisoners were allowed to enter into this uh, prison ministry. But there was one prisoner that had been rejected, that he was interested and was rejected. And that he begged and he begged uh, to get in. And I asked her as she was talking, is that, is, is that sort of like the parable of the woman who was begging the judge for justice? And she said, yes, he was like that. He was persistent. And so finally, 
the prison official said, here's the deal. We, since you are pestering us, we are going to allow you into this ministry, to participate in this ministry. But if you mess up just one time, you're back in prison, uh, you're back, uh, you're kicked out of that uh, particular ministry. It turns out that the man thrived, that his life was changed, and that today he's a very successful entrepreneur, if I can say the word, and that he's, he'll share his faith whenever he has an opportunity. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of Jermaine Wilson. Does Jermaine Wilson ring a bell with anybody? Okay. Jermaine Wilson is the mayor of Leavenworth. And that after he became the mayor of Leavenworth, he received all kinds of national publicity. And that the reason is that Jermaine Wilson had been in trouble with the law from the age 11 and continued to be in trouble with the law uh, again and again. And at the age of 21, he was sent to the Kansas Penitentiary in Lansing just up the road. And he knew that something wasn't right in his life and that he joined prison fellowship. And that literally turned his life around that he started taking education courses, anything that they offered at the prison, he took them so that he could prepare himself once he got out of prison. And once he was out of prison, he began to uh, have a job and, and, and create a financial stability. It, he also created an organization called Unity and Community in which uh, they work with youth and homeless people and also they focus on creating a good relationship between the citizens and the police. And that he also speaks about his faith whenever he has a chance. But you can imagine as to how the, the national media took a, a, a shining to him because of his story. Now these are just two examples of practical implications of loving our enemies. A friend of mine founded an organization that works with youth who have behavioral difficulties, uh, trouble with academics and run in with the law, and that they've been very successful in helping the youth get back on the track. It's not a 100% success rate, but they have a high success rate. And he has publicly said on multiple occasions that there is no such thing as a hopeless child. There is no such thing as a hopeless child. And the same can be said about our enemies, whether they're prisoners or who, whoever you want to fill in the blank with. No enemy is hopeless in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Jazz musician Johnny Coltrane was very popular in the 1950s and 1960s. He was a saxophonist. And that what he, uh, so during this time, you know, he recorded all these instrumentals, but there was one album that he put out called Love Supreme, and then he had a title song that, that was a single called Love Supreme. And, and as far as I know, it's the only one that you had vocal tracks. And what went on for maybe 90 seconds or two minutes, I don't know how long, is that what was repeated in vocals uh, uh, behind with, uh, with instrumental music behind is that it, it just keeps saying love supreme, love supreme, love supreme, love supreme. And indeed, that is what Jesus' love is all about. It is the most supreme, most awesome thing that any person could possibly have. And that is the reason that you see people, that these two stories that I shared with these men, is that the people at the prison understood that you love these folks. You don't hate them. You don't separate from them. And it's not just I'm it's speaking on behalf of prisoners. I'm speaking on behalf of anybody that is on the outcast, that's on the margins of our society. It is true that Jesus' love is supreme 
to anything on earth. May we believe and humbly use the redemptive power of Jesus' love on our enemies, trusting that change will come for the better. Let us now pray. Dear God, I think that for most of us, this is maybe one of the more difficult passages, but we also know it is perhaps one of the most important passages that Jesus taught us. That if we really, truly want this world to be a better place, then we better start decreasing our judgmentalism, our, 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 our dislike or our hate, and I'm not just talking about here in the church, I'm talking about throughout the world, dear God, and to be focused on love supreme and to know that Jesus meant what he said and we know that to be true in terms of how he treated his enemies. It wasn't just words that Jesus was saying. He gave his life because he loved his enemies. And that today, dear God, we too, can be able to experience that life that we can so generously share with others. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Before I share the words of institution, I do want to extend an invitation to anybody that wishes to come forward to make a confession that Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior and that you come forward during our final song. The final time that Jesus met before he was arrested, before he met with his disciples, before his arrest, is that they had a meal. And before the meal began, he lifted a loaf of bread and he broke it in half and he said this represents my broken body whenever you eat of it do so in memory of me then he took a cup of wine and he blessed it and he says this cup represents the blood that has been shed for all of humankind for the forgiveness of sins. And this is the promise I make, that I'll be with you until the end of time. Dear Lord, you gave us your son Jesus' life to remove our sins. As we take this bread as a symbol of Jesus' broken body hanging on the cross, 
I pray that we can accept this meal with knowledge, faith, repentance, and love. We thank you and praise your greatness for this everlasting gift. Amen. Everlasting yet ever-present God, we come to your table and receive the cup of salvation and blessing. In memory of Jesus and in gratitude for what he has meant to our lives, we give thanks. Help us to grow in our mission of witness and service to all people. Empower our redemption and commitment to living each day for you and for your world. Amen. Dear Lord, accept these offerings placed before you. They are symbols of our love and ourselves. Use these gifts and us 
to the end that thy kingdom come and thy will be done through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Before we close with our clo uh, final prayer, uh, David has a joy to share. Well, this is a joy that uh, most of you probably wouldn't know about because of the two people involved. They're so modest. But uh, this week, five days, Dennis Carnine and Jim Walters put 196 concrete screws into the tracks so that the, the uh, tiles that were falling on people's head but didn't fall won't fall in the future. 196 screws is a lot of screws into concrete. And every single screw, when that was put in, Dennis had to sharpen the bit afterwards. So I think they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> And if you feel like going up and thanking them, because uh, seeing Jim Walters on, up on the ladder, drilling into it, it was a scary thing. <laughs> Thank you for uh, sharing that joy. We, uh, it's very important, and we do appreciate it. So let's now have our closing prayer. God. Please prepare us and align us for a fresh movement of your Holy Spirit. Whatever it takes, please have your absolute way in us. We pray expectantly in the name of Jesus. Amen.